thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak at the Frontiers of Science, um, organized by Indian Academy of Sciences. I, I sincerely thank uh, the president of the academy, Professor Majumdar, and um, and of course I thank again Professor Basu for extending the invitation. So while uh, both Selena and Phil talked about um, materials at a scale where you need um, very powerful microscopes and analytical techniques. I will speak uh, on materials from an industrial perspective. And um, going even beyond industrial perspective, um, I will touch upon policies that could um, that would help society harnessing materials and um, touch upon issues that um, that affect the rapid adoption of new materials in society. Let me start uh, with some history. Um, and what is more historical and more legacy than steel? Um, so the year is 1850. And you would think steel has been there forever. But it has, it has been. It was not steel. It was iron, uh, wrought iron, which had, uh, which had low carbon but had to be wrought, which means it had to be worked into shape. Um, it had lots of um, very fine slag beaten into submission in the matrix. Uh, it wouldn't be large particles that would initiate crack, but it would give some strength in an otherwise very ductile and soft matrix. Now, this particular ferrous material was produced in batches of about 20 kilograms. And you're aware that today universities have uh, melting facilities that are way above that batch size. So this was industrial scale, 20 kilograms per batch, and you would, of course, have multiple of these units. But it would take weeks, starting from raw material to a finished product like the one on the right-hand side, to be made. And even just to make the melt, um, to decarbonize the melt, it would take um, it would take a week, right? It would take a day from 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 uh, the liquid liquid iron to uh, to fully decarbonizing it, fully in the sense of 0.08% uh, carbon. Lo and behold, it was very um, expensive and manual intensive. And at that time, this is 1850, a, a long ton, which is slightly more than a metric ton, was about 40 to 50 pounds, which is roughly three and three and a half thousand pounds uh, worth of today's money. And of course, um, it was it was all right for cutlery. It was all right for some decorative pieces. But that was roughly the time when some wars were setting were, were afoot, particularly the Boer War and um, other wars were coming up. And you need uh, you needed um, needed cannons, you needed cannon balls, and they could not be made out of steel. And uh, the other materials that were uh, that were being used uh, were, were much in demand, and the prices were going up. And of course, um, that was a demand that was being put on the on, on on the material sector at that time to find a cheaper alternative. And many people were, of course, working on that, uh, both in UK and uh, UK and abroad. And in 1856, after years of work, Henry Bessemer filed a famous patent of the Bessemer converter, which um, which which took about um, anywhere between five to 10 tons of uh, liquid, um, liquid iron. And you could blow air through the bottom of that vessel. And that and the oxygen in the um, in, in the air uh, decarbonized the melt. This process revolutionized steel making. It brought down prices from $40 to $7. It reduced manpower significantly. And lo and behold, before it was uh, turn of the decade, this steel was being used in artillery. And of course, people don't stand still. They kept on making innovations and modifications to the, uh, to the process. There were the Gilchrist uh, cousins who uh, made a mod major modification to Bessemer's original um, uh, original idea, which used 
clay as an internal lining that replaced clay with dolomite and lime, which instantly increased the array of raw materials that this particular process could handle. And um, just to make a point here, having basic uh, basic refractory lining meant that you could deal with phosphorus in the, in the hot metal, and that meant you could you could use uh, lower priced um, phos high phosphorus ores for making steel. Now, because of this attractive process, it was not surprising it got it got adopted in USA very quickly. In in the middle of 1965s, and it went on to make about 26 million tons of steel by 19 uh, sorry 1865, and then went on to make about 26 million tons of steel by 1910. And as volumes grew, as the process became more and more optimized, prices dropped. So so much so that um, you can see from this graph, when initially started, the prices were around 170 dollars per short term short ton and it went on to become about twenty dollars per short and that's that's an enormous um impact on popularizing this material and this was in fact the most popular material for driving um, no puns intended railways into the heartland of usa and the name carnegie um comes in comes comes into play here but of course, like everything else, um, even technologies have decline and demise. Um, the major issue with, with the steel that comes came out of the Bessemer converter was um, was was nitrogen. You could not have access to pure oxygen, although the inventors and the innovators knew that pure oxygen was the answer. It just was not commercially available at scale, and at that time. And this nitrogen caused brittleness. And therefore, the word of steel transferred itself back to a puddling like process where you take a pool of molten iron and you paddle that iron so that the liquid, liquid iron gets exposed to air and uh, gets oxidized. Uh, and it was called the open hearth furnace. So there was a period of about, period of about 50 years when Bessemer converters became went out of vogue, the, the open, hearts, um, open hearts came in. And by 1940s, uh, driven again by a war, um, oxygen became uh, commercially available at scale. And lo and behold, uh, there was a Bessemer-like process that came in, which was the, the lens Donowitz converter, which was the oxygen blast at uh, four or five Mac from the top it's using a lance um, that's, that came in and ruled the world for the next 50, 60 years. So if we step back and look at the evolution of steel making over the last 150, 150 years, the developments were driven by external factors, um, wars in, in the UK by the railroad expansion, um, essentially expanding into the heartland of, uh, of US, uh, productivity and cost um, post Second World War. And looking forward, it will be driven, any change coming up will be driven by environment. Deep decarbonization is the way forward for the steel industry. Just to give you some figures, for every ton of steel that is made in an integrated steel plant today, the sector produces two tons of carbon dioxide. So for every ton of steel, there is two tons of carbon dioxide. The world makes 1.6 billion tons of steel. That's 3.2 billion tons of carbon dioxide. That's no way to go forward. So going for deep, for deep decarbonization, which means going to net zero, CO2 footprint is the way forward. And essentially, there are two routes. One is to capture the CO2 that is coming out, because you cannot just wish it away with all the uh, expensive assets that are in place. Excuse me. So CO2 capture at scale. And when I say at scale, a typical integrated steel plant would be about 10 million tons annual capacity. 
which would be producing about 20 million tons of CO2 per year. And we would need to capture 20 million tons of CO2, but just capturing doesn't help. You need to do something with it. So CO2 utilization, so that's 20 million tons of CO2 to be utilized somewhere per steel plant is uh, no, no mean feat and no technology today exists that answers that question. So this CO2 could be converted into products such as methanol or ethanol or polycarbonates or proteins or, uh, or, or feed for algae and so on and so forth. But the scale of millions and billions of tons um, is just not um, is, is just not addressable by any of these means as of now. Route two is to use hydrogen as the reductant, and of course, for that you would need you would need hydrogen that is green and hydrogen that is cheap. Today, you can produce hydrogen that is green in in Europe, where you can choose to have a large part of your grid electricity made up of renewables, not in India. And then the cost and the price of green of renewable electricity is coming down. But in India, you need to look beyond uh, a green grid, so to speak. So electrolysis, although is one solution for producing hydrogen, it is not the full solution in India. Um, we have to look at biomass. We have to look at chemical looping technologies um, for, for, for coming out with other sources of cheap green hydrogen. And of course, this hydrogen will then be used to direct reduce iron ore in a gas-based direct reduction furnace. And that iron and that DRI, as it is called in short, uh, would be put in an electric arc furnace for steel making. And this electric arc furnace would be run on uh, renewable electricity. And of course, this would mean that uh, going forward, even the the Lins Donowitz uh, basic uh, oxygen blown process will gradually be replaced by electric arc steel making. So it will, in a way, you can see a full picture of how steel making changes every every about fifty years. And um, unlike the past, where you could associate. This, the changes in technology with individual names, Decima, for example. Um, going forward, that would not be the case because um, the technologies are getting complicated because you would need expertise from multiple um, other domains. Um, so what would be available uh, for, for, for a Bessema in terms of uh, resource uh, would would be tenfold more complicated for a, for, a, for a researcher or a technologist today. So it is, um, it is not, not only resource, it is also addressing the scale. So as I mentioned, CO2 capture and utilization at scale for hundreds of million tons of CO2 is not trivial. And, and just to take an example, if you convert the CO2 of a 10 million ton plant that's 20 million tons of CO2 into say polycarbonate. It will flood the market of polycarbonate in the world. It will crash that market and um, it will have no economic value and therefore will not be a worthwhile product to make. Just to give one example. So there will be needed multiple technologies. So it is just not one person, one expertise that could come up with multiple solutions for, for just one. So one route that is carbon dioxide capture and use. You would need um, polymer scientists, you would need biologists, you would need, of course, chemical engineers and, and metallurgical engineers to work together across multiple, multiple, multiple um, industries and academia. Just to take an example of hydrogen, if you need green electricity at low cost, the scale at which hydrogen needs to be produced you know, just for a million tons of iron, which is a very tiny uh, steel plant, is about 0.6 billion normal meter cube. That's about 54,000 tons of H2 per year. Um, so you can imagine how, you know, uh, if, if the grid doesn't have green electricity, you would need multiple other sources, other technologies to produce cheap green electricity. Driven by all this that I've just mentioned, you would need a coherent, um, a coherent string of fundamental research working together with piloting of the technologies and 
scaling up to commercialization. They have to work in conjunction. And if I just picturize it as a technology readiness level scale from zero to nine, where the first three are academia and the middle uh, four, five, six are industrial labs or CSIR here stands for this, the, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in India. It, various countries have their own, own mechanisms for, for this middle uh, TRL levels. Um, UK, for example, has the, uh, has the catapult centers. Germany has the Fraunhofer Institute, et cetera. And the, and the last part, close to commercialization and commercialization would need an industry pull. And these three essential blocks would need to be strung together coherently with focus, recognizing fully well that at each of the junctions, there are um, valleys of death. And this is where handover fails and technologies flop. Although they could be perfectly, uh, uh, perfectly viable technologies, they would fail at, hand, at, at these handover stages. And whatever policies we put in, in place at the national level or at the industrial level or the sectorial level need to take conscious cognizance of the fact that there is uh, a finite value, value of death at these, at these crossovers. I'll talk a little, more, little bit more with some more examples as we go along. Let's um, take uh, carbon fiber, a more recent material uh, compared to steel. Carbon fibers first, uh, of course, you know, the first carbon fibers appeared in, in the 19th century, but really in the form of, the, of structural material uh, was formed out of rayon in 1950s, um, out of polyacrylonitrile, nitrile, that is pan, which is the most commonly used raw material for carbon, for, for, for carbon fiber came out in 1960s. In the 1970s and 80s, it saw use in defense um, and a bit in, in, in Formula One cars. And it was not till the middle of 1990s, more like 2000, but later that um, carbon fiber saw increased adaptation uh, in, in multiple industries, including wind, um, a little bit in automotive and also in sports goods. Just to take an example of aerospace, this is an example of Boeing and Airbus. Um, as you go from left to right, um, these are more, you go to more, for more recent um, aircrafts, 787 for Boeing and A350. You go down the rows, you come to composites, you'll see both Boeing and Airbus have, um, have a dominant carbon fiber composite strategy with roughly with 50 or more percentage of the uh, materials that are being that are used in the, in the body uh, of, of the aircraft um, being made up of uh, carbon fiber this and and ad adoption of this material in in wind energy in sports and automotive as i as i've said um, has driven the volume demand for carbon fiber which has been good um, it's grown at four times the average GDP growth rate of the world. Um, and driven by this growth and volume, the price of carbon fiber has come down. Uh, at, at one time, carbon fiber was selling at um, $100 per kg. It is now $20 per kg. If it comes down to about $10 per kg, we'll see, um, in my opinion, we will see a uh, large adoption in automotive, which will again be a sort of a hockey stick um, event for growth in demand for carbon fiber. Let's look at the India scenario. And I'm, um, I am going to be focused a little bit um, in, a, in a biased manner on Indian scenario for um, advanced materials. Um, India, India today consumes about 750 tons. The M here doesn't stand for, uh, for, for, for uh, thousand, it stands for um, metric. Uh, which is less than 1% of global consumption. So it's a, it's a really tiny, um, uh, tiny market uh, compared, to, compared to the globe. Um, however, for, for defense and for aerospace, this is a very strategic material for the country. Um, with this sort of a market size, it is, it is very difficult to get industry interested in putting up 
production basis. More so because the technology for producing carbon fiber is heavily intellectual property protected by a few uh, large companies, both in the East and in the West. But there is opportunity for India as a nation to build uh, strength in this very strategic material, carbon fiber. If you look at the cost breakup of carbon fiber, um, a large part, more than 50% is in the precursor, which is PAN, polyacryl and nitrile. And there's a, there's a significant portion in labor. In both these cases, India can play, uh, India can have opportunity. And I'll, and I'll show you how. Of course, labor is, uh, is, is, an, is an easy guess, and I will not uh, harp upon it. Let us look at uh, precursors. The traditional precursor PAN has been worked upon, researched, and developed over the last 40, 40 years. And no wonder that the products that we see today and the applications of carbon fiber that we see today are tailored to the properties of carbon fiber that you get once you use PAN as the precursor. So on the on the left is the is the is the pan based precursor uh, production route, and on the right is the alternate to pan, which is coal tar pitch. Now, India's um, India today is um, the third largest, third or second, uh, on the verge of being second largest steel producer in the world after China. India's today producing 105 million tons, going and it's increasing in capacity every year. It, is, it has a target of going to 300 million tons. Now, coal tar pitch comes out of coke making, of the coke making process. So this is a material that uh, is indigenous and the raw material would not be dependent on, uh, on, on imported um, precursor, uh, which is a product of petrochemical and India is not large on petrochemicals. The production route would be different because it is a different starter starter material. You will need isotropic pitch. You will need some heat treatment to make mesophase pitch, which will be melt spun and then converted to carbon fiber. This technology is nascent. Only, a, only very few companies in the world have, um, have tried producing carbon fiber within this technology. And of course, it has not got much attention in terms of research and development. Of course, the nature of, uh, of of the material is different. It has um, it is not as uniform as the, as the material produced through um, from actual nitrile. It has it is um, it is a mixture of um, of various carbon phases. But then, with this is the opportunity that India has to carry out its own research and development and and produce this and and and, and master its own technology where uh, with 300 million tons of iron and steel, it would have its own precursor base. But if you look at the ecosystem in India for carrying out this true TRL uh, work on carbon fiber, you'll see if you start with the basic knowledge, there is hardly any research group in India that works on carbon fiber. And therefore there are very few research um, fellows, the number of PhDs are small. That's a gap. There's only one pilot in India, which is at the National Aerospace Lab in Bangalore, which has been working on it for the last 25 years. There is, there is expertise there, but it works on pan precursor. Manufacturing, India has none, and of course with reason. But then um, if India has to take leadership in a material that is strategic, it needs to relook at um, at at the at the um, at the enablers which will incentivize industry to put manufacturing base in India, right? And that is market. The Indian aerospace and industry market does not really pull carbon fiber today, and it is a bit of a chicken and egg because carbon fiber is expensive. Um, aerospace in India is small. Uh, the other sectors don't need or don't want such an expensive material. Um, we need to look at this whole value chain differently. We need to have a national focus on developing 
the market for carbon fiber and treat the world as the, as the market, with India as its manufacturing base. We need to address the gaps through policy. We should encourage, for example, carbon dioxide export, once, uh, not carbon dioxide export, sorry, carbon fiber export and carbon fiber that is produced in India to be exported. Essentially to create a market for producing in India and drive research and, and pilot plant for pitch-based carbon fiber making. Use pitch as a raw material for carbon fiber and the carbon fiber with, with capability to get into aerospace and industrial products. I'll give an example of graphene and Phil is very well versed with graphene um, in, in being in Manchester, both the, Roy, the Royce Institute and the, and the two graphene institutes of which their neighbors um, are world leaders in graphene. But I'll give you an example of how um, creating an ecosystem, not necessarily in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nation, but even in, a, in an industry can, can accelerate adoption of a material. So um, Tata Steel has, uh, has its own patents in graphene production and we produce um, graphene from two sources, graphite and seed lac. Seed lag being a being a plant product which is uh, quite uh, prevalent in an eastern part of um, of India, and we have used graphene commercially now. In I'm, I'm just uh, fast forwarding five or six years. Our first patents came out in 2011, 12, 13. That 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 sort of uh, time, and in 2000. Uh, 17, we set up the graphene business, and today we are uh, commercially selling graphene-based products. Graphene goes into screens for um, handling raw materials. They get into conveyor belts, which increase life of conveyor, conveyor belts by about three times. They get into hybrid idlers, again, idle rollers, idler rollers for conveyor belts. Life has gone up by three times. Uh, we are now putting graphene into um, HDP pipes for uh, conveyance. We're making graphene for master batches that could go into rubber and um, other uh, rubber and polymers. We're using graphene as coating on steel, especially rebars, to give them um, limited period uh, surface corrosion protection. We put doping um, uh, doping gra dope graphene for powder uh, for for coating of tubes, and we are um, producing graphene aerosols for spraying on on metallic surfaces and also on textile surfaces to give hydrophob hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties. We see graphene can address a large market if it gets into products. And these markets could be in hundreds of millions of dollars. We are currently setting up a plant which is 100 tons per annum capacity and will be inaugurated this December. Uh, um, Hopefully, COVID will subside to enable us to inaugurate that. Um, and we are exploring markets um, which are large, for example, in apparels, in packaging, and, uh, and energy. Now, all this development uh, within, say, seven, eight years of filing the patent and going commercial has been done in an ecosystem created within the company which traversed the entire TRL level from zero to nine. So this was possible because uh, graphene was new. It could be, you could create a niche and a protective um, uh, sort of umbrella in which this was uh, incubated and grown. But it can't be done for a large number of such, uh, large number of advanced materials. But for, for, for that, you need, you need the nation to have focus. Let me let me give you, give some indications of my thoughts as, as to what needs to be done at a national level. We need to be able to promote market for for advanced materials. We cannot create markets suddenly domestically, so we need to have export incentives to to treat the group the globe as the market. We need to ensure focus through themed public funding. Um, 
there are examples across the world how certain areas are uh, certain areas are given public funding to um, to gain uh, for for countries to gain dominance and um, proficiency in those materials across the TRL levels. As as uh, Phil had mentioned um, uh, briefly in his in his talk. UK is, uh, is, is uh, UK's fundamentals in, in materials is very, very strong. It is, um, and it realized uh, that the translation to, to commercialization was perhaps a little weak and it, um, and it created the system of catapults, which, and these systems take time to, to, to kick in and to become fully, fully active. But they have a system of uh, catapults, which, which, are, which, which can help in translating fundamental research into commercialization. Uh, similarly, India has a setup and it can be strengthened through maybe the CSIR labs to have a, to have a translation platform uh, and, uh, and create focus in, 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 in certain themes um, by, um, which are publicly declared. And then encourage through, uh, through DRL funding covering industry, academia, research labs, and very importantly, the medium and small sector industry. Funding at the academic level can be large in number, but small in amount. Um, that's the nature of the project. And you need to encourage large number of ideas coming in. And it would also encourage building of a pipeline of scientists and engineers in those focused fields. And funding is absolutely necessary also for new technology to be implemented at industry. Who takes the risk of commercializing something that is new to the world. There has to be risk sharing. And therefore, it is important to realize that public funding to de-risk industry is necessary. And the nature of funding could be small in number, but per se, it needs to be large in amount because you have scaled up to commercial scale. And while creating this policy, one has to realize and be conscious of the value of debt and make sure that there is continuity through the TRL once the focused um, themes are put in place and teams are created across uh, TRL levels. I'll give you a few um, examples of where we have missed opportunities and how we can address new opportunities going forward. Photovoltaic, you know, the, the slide on the, the, the picture on the left is, uh, common, is, is very well known. <laughs> Excuse me. This is produced um, every year by the National uh, Renewable Energy Lab uh, in, in USA, and it tracks all the evolving PV technologies throughout uh, through the decades. India doesn't feature on this on this chart. India has not developed, has not it, it made, missed the wave. It just didn't develop its own PV technology. And of course, now the graph on the right as it shows um, the, the price of PV has fallen dramatically and the, if unpredictably, if I may say so, even in India, it has now become grid parity at, with, with coal-based uh, coal power. So development cost at this low price cannot be borne. So India's only choice left now is to buy technology, not develop. So in my opinion, I think we have missed the photovoltaic technologies. Titanium is, a, is an opportunity waiting. India has the third largest deposit of titanium for resource in its uh, beach sands across uh, southern India and up the eastern coast. But India makes, again, less than 1% of global production of titanium in a plant uh, that is suboptimal uh, in, in size and um, doesn't have the requisite um, recycling of magnesium in place. Excuse me. And lo and behold, its um, its price is non-competitive. Again, this is an area where strategic material need to give focus, align the TRL levels, <clears throat> create incentive for a global market, and uh, set an ecosystem in place. Looking forward, opportunity lies in energy material. India is going, going fast on electric vehicles. 
electric vehicles will need batteries and batteries will need certain materials which are not um, uh, abundant in India, lithium, nickel, cobalt. So we will be essentially be replacing a set of, replacing one imported energy material, oil, with a set of, uh, another set of imported materials, which are battery materials. On the other hand, we could look at local resources, <coughs> excuse me, um, which the rest of the world doesn't look at. So these are in the overburden of ores. The overburden of certain ores in India, especially in Eastern India, contain nickel and cobalt. Today, we do not have a scalable technology, but this is an opportunity where together with academia, CSIR labs and industry, we could work on a technology that is um, that is ours to um, derive these essential elements for the future for um, for domestic use. We should also have um, a, a thriving technology development in urban mining, where uh, which oil doesn't lend itself to urban mining, but these materials do. And um, unlike say rare earths or even steel, where urban mining is mostly dominated by very very disorganized small scale players, we have an opportunity at this stage to, <coughs> excuse me, to organize um, and put technology into urban mining of energy materials. I talked about the need for government, industry, academia, MSME to work together. It's like the triple helix, the government, industry, academia working together. But unlike, um, unlike the double helix of um, which, which, uh, which is autonomous and it can drive a system, the triple helix needs to be driven, right? Um, so we need to find who leads in, in this triple, triple helix system. It could be the industry, it could be academia, uh, it could be the government. And I think the, the debate is on and the discussion uh, is rife as to who, um, who builds the cat in, in this triple helix system. But the triple helix is absolutely needed for us to create a robust ecosystem going forward. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>